Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter twenty five. Dr. Seward's Diary. Eleven October. Evening. Jonathan Harker has asked me to note this, as he says he is hardly equal to the task, and he wants an exact record kept. I think that none of us were surprised when we were asked to see Mrs. Harker a little before the time of sunset. We have of late come to understand that sunrise and sunset are, to her, times of peculiar freedom, when her own self can be manifest without any controlling force subduing or restraining her, or inciting her to action. This mood or condition begins some half-hour or more before actual sunrise or sunset, and lasts till either the sun is high or whilst the clouds are still aglow with the rays streaming above the horizon. At first there is a sort of negative condition, as if some tie were loosened, and then the absolute freedom quickly follows. When, however, the freedom ceases, the change back or relapse comes quickly, preceded only by a spell of warning silence. Tonight, when we met, she was somewhat constrained, and bore all the signs of an internal struggle. I put it down myself to her making a violent effort at the earliest instant she could do so. A very few minutes, however, gave her complete control of herself. Then, motioning her husband to sit beside her on the sofa where she was half reclining, she made the rest of us bring chairs up close. Taking her husband's hand in hers, she began, We are all here together in freedom for perhaps the last time. I know that you will always be with me to the end. This was to her husband, whose hand had, as we could see, tightened upon her. In the morning we go out upon our task, and God only knows what may be in store for any of us. You are going to be so good to me, to take me with you. I know that all that brave, earnest men can do for a poor, weak woman, whose soul perhaps is lost, no, no, not yet, but is at any rate at stake you will do. But you must remember that I am not as you are. There is a poison in my blood, in my soul, which may destroy me, which must destroy me, unless some relief comes to us. Oh, my friends, you know as well as I do that my soul is at stake. And though I know there is one way out for me, you must not, and I must not take it. She looked appealingly to us, all in turn, beginning and ending with her husband. What is that way? asked Van Helsing in a hoarse voice. What is that way which we must not, may not take? That I may die now, either by my own hand or that of another, before the greater evil is entirely wrought. I know, and you know, that were I once dead, you could and would set free my immortal spirit, even as you did my poor Lucy's, were death, or the fear of death, the only thing that stood in the way. I would not shrink to die here now, amidst the friends who loved me. But death is not all. I cannot believe that to die in such a case when there is hope before us, and a bitter task to be done, is God's will. Therefore, I, on my part, give up here the certainty of eternal rest, and go out into the dark where may be the blackest things that the world or the nether world holds. We were all silent, for we knew instinctively that this was only a prelude. The faces of the others were set, and Harker's grew ashen gray. Perhaps he guessed better than any of us what was coming. She continued, This is what I can give into the hotch-pot. I could not but note the quaint legal phrase which she used in such a place with all seriousness. 
what will each of you give she went on quickly that is easy for brave men your lives are god's and you can give them back to him but what will you give to me she looked again questioningly but this time avoided her husband's face quincey seemed to understand he nodded and her face lit up then i shall tell you plainly what i want for there must be no doubtful matter in this connection between us now you must promise me one and all even you my beloved husband that should the time come you will kill me what is that time the voice was quincey's but it was low and strained when you shall be convinced that i am so changed that it is better that i die that i may live when i am thus dead in the flesh then you will without a moment's delay drive a stake through me and cut off my head or do whatever else may be wanting to give me rest quincey was the first to rise after the pause he knelt down before her and taking her hand in his said solemnly i'm only a rough fellow who hasn't perhaps lived as a man should to win such a distinction but i swear to you by all that i hold sacred and dear that should the time ever come i shall not flinch from the duty that you have set us and i promise you too that i shall make all certain for if i am only doubtful i shall take it that the time has come my true friend was all she could say amid her fast falling tears as bending over she kissed his hand i swear the same my dear madam mina said van helsing and i said lord galdamin each of them in turn kneeling to her to take the oath i followed myself then her husband turned to her wan-eyed and with the greenish pallor which subdued the snowy whiteness of his hair and asked and i must too make such a promise o oh, my wife you too my dearest she said with infinite yearning of pity in her eyes and voice you must not shrink you are nearest and dearest in all the world to me our souls are knit into one for all life and all time think dear that there have been times when brave men have killed their wives and their womenkind to keep them from falling into the hands of the enemy their hands did not falter any more because those that they loved implored them to slay them it is men's duty towards those whom they love in such times of sore trial and oh my dear if it is to be that i must meet death at any hand let it be at the hand of him that loves me best dr van helsing i have not forgotten your mercy in poor lucy's case to him who loved she stopped with a flying blush and changed her phrase to him who had best right to give her peace if that time shall come again i look to you to make it a happy memory of my husband's life that it was his loving hand which set me free from the awful thrall upon me again i swear came the professor's resonant voice mrs harker smiled positively smiled as with a sigh of relief she leaned back and said and now one word of warning a warning which you must never forget this time if it ever come may come quickly and unexpectedly and in such case you must lose no time in using your opportunity at such a time i myself might be nay if the time ever come shall be leagued with your enemy against you 
one more request. She became very solemn as she said this. It is not vital and necessary like the other, but I want you to do one thing for me, if you will. We all acquiesced, but no one spoke. There was no need to speak. I want you to read the burial service. She was interrupted by a deep groan from her husband. Taking his hand in hers, she held it over her heart, and continued, You must read it over me some day. Whatever may be the issue of all this fearful state of things, it will be a sweet thought to all, or some of us. You, my dearest, will, I hope, read it, for then it will be your voice in my memory for ever, come what may. But, oh, my dear one, he pleaded, death is afar from you. Nay, she said, holding up a warning hand, I am deeper in death at this moment than if the weight of an earthly grave lay heavy upon me. Oh, my wife, must I read it, he said, before he began. It would comfort me, my husband, was all she said, and he began to read when she had got the book ready. How can I, how could any one, tell of that strange scene, its solemnity, its gloom, its sadness, its horror, and, withal, its sweetness? Even a skeptic, who can see nothing but a travesty of bitter truth in anything holy or emotional, would have been melted to the heart had he seen that little group of loving and devoted friends kneeling round that stricken and sorrowing lady, or heard the tender passion of her husband's voice, as in tones so broken and emotional that often he had to pause, he read the simple and beautiful service from the burial of the dead. <sighs> I cannot go on. Words and voices fail me. She was right in her instinct. Strange as it was, bizarre as it may here afterwards seem, even to us who had felt its potent influence at the time, it comforted us much, and the silence which showed Mrs. Harker's coming relapse from her freedom of soul did not seem so full of despair to any of us as we had dreaded. Jonathan Harker's Journal 15 October Varna We left Charing Cross on the morning of the 12th, got to Paris the same night, and took the places secured for us in the Orient Express. We travelled night and day, arriving here at about five o'clock. Lord Godalming went to the consulate to see if any telegram had arrived for him, whilst the rest of us came on to this hotel, the Odessus. The journey may have had incidents. I was, however, too eager to get on to care for them. Until the Tsarina Catherine comes into port, there will be no interest for me in anything in the wide world. Thank God, Mina is well, and looks to be getting stronger. Her colour is coming back. She sleeps a great deal. Throughout the journey she slept nearly all the time. Before sunrise and sunset, however, she is very wakeful and alert, and it has become a habit for Van Helsing to hypnotise her at such times. At first... Some effort was needed, and he had to make many passes. But now she seems to yield at once, as if by habit, and scarcely any action is needed. He seems to have power, at these particular moments, to simply will, and her thoughts obey him. He always asks her what she can see and hear. She answers to the first, Nothing, all is dark. And to the second, I can hear the waves lapping against the ship, and the water rushing by. Canvas and cordage strain, and masts and yards creak. The wind is high. I can hear it in the shrouds, 
and the bow throws back the foam. It is evident that the Tsarina Catherine is still at sea, hastening on her way to Varna. Lord Godalming has just returned. He had four telegrams, one each day since we started, and all to the same effect, that the Tsarina Catherine had not been reported to Lloyd's from anywhere. He had arranged before leaving London that his agent should send him every day a telegram saying if the ship had been reported. He was to have a message even if she were not reported, so that he might be sure that there was a watch being kept at the other end of the wire. We had dinner and went to bed early. Tomorrow we are to see the vice-consul and to arrange, if we can, about getting on board the ship as soon as she arrives. Van Helsing says that our chance will be to get on the boat between sunrise and sunset. The Count, even if he takes the form of a bat, cannot cross the running water of his own volition, and so cannot leave the ship. As he dare not change to man's form without suspicion, which he evidently wishes to avoid, he must remain in the box. If, then, we can come on board after sunrise, he is at our mercy, for we can open the box and make sure of him, as we did of poor Lucy, before he wakes. What mercy he shall get from us all will not count for much. We think that we shall not have much trouble with officials or the seamen. Thank God! This is the country where bribery can do anything, and we are well supplied with money. We have only to make sure that the ship cannot come into port between sunset and sunrise without our being warned, and we shall be safe. Judge Moneybag will settle this case, I think. 16. October. Mina's report, still the same. Lapping waves and rushing water, darkness and favouring winds. We are evidently in good time, and when we hear of the Tsarina Catherine, we shall be ready. As she must pass the Dardanelles, we are sure to have some report. 17. October. Everything is pretty well fixed now, I think, to welcome the Count on his return from his tour. Godalming told the shippers that he fancied that the box sent aboard might contain something stolen from a friend of his, and got a half-consent that he might open it at his own risk. The owner gave him a paper telling the captain to give him every facility in doing whatever he chose on board the ship, and also a similar authorization to his agent at Varna. We have seen the agent who was much impressed with Godalming's kindly manner to him, and we are all satisfied that whatever he can do to aid our wishes will be done. We have already arranged what to do in case we get the box open. If the Count is there, Van Helsing and Seward will cut off his head at once and drive a stake through his heart. Morris and Godalming and I shall prevent interference even if we have to use the arms which we shall have ready. The professor says that if we can so treat the Count's body, it will soon after fall into dust. In such case there would be no evidence against us, in case any suspicion of murder were aroused. But even if it were not, we should stand or fall by our act, and perhaps some day this very script may be evidence to come between some of us and a rope. For myself, I should take the chance only too thankfully if it were to come. We mean to leave no stone unturned to carry out our intent. We have arranged with certain officials that the instant the Tsarina Catherine is seen, we are to be informed by a special messenger. 24. October a whole week of waiting. Daily telegrams to Godalming, but only the same story. Not yet reported. Mina's morning and evening hypnotic answer is unvaried. Lapping waves, rushing water, and creaking masts. Telegram, October 24th, Rufus Smith, Lloyd's, London, to Lord Godalming, care of H.P.A.M. Vice-Council, Varna.
Xarina Catherine reported this morning from Dardanelles. Dr. Seward's Diary 25 October How I miss my phonograph! To write a diary with a pen is irksome to me, but Van Helsing says I must. We were all wild with excitement yesterday when Galdamin got his telegram from Lloyd's. I know now how men feel in battle when the call to action is heard. Mrs. Harker alone of our party did not show any signs of emotion. After all, it is not strange that she did not, for we took special care not to let her know anything about it, and we all tried not to show any excitement when we were in her presence. In old days she would, I am sure, have noticed, no matter how we might have tried to conceal it. But in this way she is greatly changed during the past three weeks. The lethargy grows upon her, and though she seems strong and well, and is getting back some of her color, Van Helsing and I are not satisfied. We talk of her often. We have not, however, said a word to the others. It would break poor Harker's heart, certainly his nerve, if he knew that we had even a suspicion on the subject. Van Helsing examines, he tells me, her teeth very carefully, whilst she is in the hypnotic condition, for he says that so long as they do not begin to sharpen, there is no active danger of a change in her. If this change should come, it would be necessary to take steps. We both know what those steps would have to be, though we do not mention our thoughts to each other. We should neither of us shrink from the task, awful though it be to contemplate. Euthanasia is an excellent and a comforting word. I am grateful to whoever invented it. It is only about twenty-four hours' sail from the Dardanelles to here, at the rate the Tsarzina Catherine has come from London. She should, therefore, arrive some time in the morning, but as she cannot possibly get in before noon, we are all about to retire early. We shall get up at one o'clock, so as to be ready. 25 October, Noon no news yet of the ship's arrival. Mrs. Harker's hypnotic report this morning was the same as usual, so it is possible that we may get news at any moment. We men are all in a fever of excitement, except Harker, who is calm. His hands are cold as ice, and an hour ago I found him wetting the edge of the great Gorka knife, which he now always carries with him. It will be a bad lookout for the Count if the edge of that kukri ever touches his throat, driven by that stern, ice-cold hand. Van Helsing and I were a little alarmed about Mrs. Harker today. About noon she got into a sort of lethargy, which he did not like. Although he kept silence to the others, we were neither of us happy about it. She had been restless all the morning, so that we were at first glad to know that she was sleeping. When, however, her husband mentioned casually that she was sleeping so soundly that he could not wake her, we went to her room to see for ourselves. She was breathing naturally, and looked so well and peaceful, that we agreed that the sleep was better for her than anything else. Poor girl, she has so much to forget that it is no wonder that sleep, if it brings oblivion to her, does her good. Later. Our opinion was justified, for when, after a refreshing sleep of some hours, she woke up, she seemed brighter and better than she had been for days. At sunset she made the usual hypnotic report, Wherever he may be in the Black Sea, the Count is hurrying to his destination. To his doom, I trust. 26 October. Another day and no tidings of the Tsarina Catherine. She ought to be here by now. 
that she is still journeying somewhere is apparent, for Mrs. Harker's hypnotic report at sunrise was still the same. It is possible that the vessel may be lying by, at times, for fog. Some of the steamers, which came in last evening, reported patches of fog both to the north and south of the port. We must continue our watching, as the ship may now be signaled at any moment. 27 October Noon Most strange. No news yet of the ship we wait for. Mrs. Harker reported last night and this morning as usual. Lapping waves and rushing water, though she had added that the waves were very faint. The telegrams from London have been the same. No further report. Van Helsing is terribly anxious, and told me just now that he fears the Count is escaping us. He added significantly, I did not like that lethargy of Madame Mina's. Souls and memories can do strange things during trance. I was about to ask him more, but Harker just then came in, and he held up a warning hand. We must try tonight at sunset to make her speak more fully when in her hypnotic state. 28 October Telegram Rufus Smith, London, to Lord Godalming Care HBM Vice Council, Varna Sarina Catherine reported entering Galatz at one o'clock today. Dr. Seward's Diary 28 October when the telegram came announcing the arrival in Galatz, I do not think it was such a shock to any of us as might have been expected. True, we did not know whence or how or when the bolt would come, but I think we all expected that something strange would happen. The day of arrival at Varna made us individually satisfied that things would not be just as we had expected. We only waited to learn where the change would occur. None the less, however, it was a surprise. I suppose that nature works on such a hopeful basis that we believe against ourselves that things will be set as they ought to be, not as we should know that they will be. Transcendentalism is a beacon to the angels, even if it be a will of the wisp to man. Van Helsing raised his hand over his head for a moment, as though in remonstrance with the Almighty. But he said not a word, and, in a few seconds, stood up with his face sternly set. Lord Godalming grew very pale, and sat breathing heavily. I was myself half-stunned, and looked in wonder at one after another. Quincy Morris tightened his belt with that quick movement, which I knew so well. In our old wandering days, it meant action. Mrs. Harker grew ghastly white, so that the scar on her forehead seemed to burn, but she folded her hands meekly and looked up in prayer. Harker smiled, actually smiled, the dark, bitter smile of one who is without hope, but at the same time his action belied his words, for his hands instinctively sought the hilt of the great Kukri knife, and rested there. "'When does the next train start for Galatz?' said Van Helsing to us generally. "'At six-thirty tomorrow morning.' We all started, for the answer came from Mrs. Harker. "'How on earth do you know?' said Art. "'You forget, or perhaps you do not know,' though Jonathan does, and so does Dr. Van Helsing, that I am a train fiend. At home in Exeter I always used to make up the timetables so as to be helpful to my husband. I found it so useful sometimes that I always make a study of the timetables now. I knew that if anything were to take us to Castle Dracula, we should go by Galatz, or at any rate through Bucharest, so I learned the times very carefully. Unhappily, there are not many to learn, as the only train tomorrow 
leaves, as I say. Wonderful woman, murmured the professor. Can't we get a special? asked Lord Godalming. Van Helsing shook his head. I fear not. This land is very different from yours or mine. Even if we did have a special, it would probably not arrive as soon as our regular train. Moreover, we have something to prepare. We must think. Now, let us organize. You, friend Arthur, go to the train and get the tickets and arrange that all be ready for us to go in the morning. Do you, friend Jonathan, go to the agent of the ship and get from him letters to the agent in Galatz, with authority to make a search of the ship, just as it was here. Quincy Morris, you see the vice consul and get his aid with his fellow in Galatz, and all he can do to make our way smooth, so that no times be lost when over the Danube. John will stay with Madame Mina and me, and we shall consult, for so, if time be long, you may be delayed, and it will not matter when the sun set, since I am here with Madame to make report. And I, said Mrs. Harker brightly, and more like her old self than she had been for many a long day, shall try to be of use in all ways, and I shall think and write for you as I used to. Something is shifting from me in some strange way, and I feel freer than I have been of late. The three younger men looked happier at the moment, as they seemed to realize the significance of her words. But... Van Helsing and I, turning to each other, met each a grave and troubled glance. We said nothing at the time, however. When the three men had gone out to their tasks, Van Helsing asked Mrs. Harker to look up the copy of the diaries and find him the part of Harker's journal at the castle. She went away to get it. When the door was shut upon her, he said to me, we mean the same. Speak out. Here is some change. It is a hope that makes me sick, for it may deceive us. Quite so. Do you know why I asked her to get the manuscript? No, said I, unless it was an opportunity of seeing me alone. You are in part right, friend John, but only in part. I want to tell you something, and... Oh, my friend, I'm taking a great terrible risk, but I believe it is right. In the moment when Madame Mina said those words that arrest both our understanding, an inspiration came to me. In the trance of three days ago, the Count sent her to his spirit to read her mind, or more like he took her to see him in his earth box in the ship with water rushing just as it go free at rise and set of sun. He learned, then, that we are here, for she had more to tell in her open life, with eyes to see, ears to hear, than he, shut as he is in his coffin box. Now he make his most effort to escape us. At present he want her not. He is sure, with his so great knowledge, that she will come at his call. But he cut her off, take her, as he can do, out of his brain power, that so she come not to him. Ah, there I have hope that our man's brains, that have been of man so long, and that have not lost the grace of God, will come higher than his child brain, that lie in his tomb for centuries, that grow not yet to our stature, and that do not work selfish, and therefore small. Here comes Madame Mina, not a word to her of her trance. She knows it not, and it would overwhelm her, and make despair just when we want all her hope, all her courage, when most we want all her great brain that is trained like man's brain 
but is of sweet woman, and have a special power which the Count give her, and which he may not take away altogether, though he thinks so. Hush, let me speak, and you shall learn. Oh, John, my friend, we are in awful straits. I fear, as I never feared before, we can only trust the good God. Silence. Here she comes. I thought that the professor was going to break down and have hysterics, just as he had when Lucy died. But, with a great effort, he controlled himself, and was at perfect nervous poise, when Mrs. Harker tripped into the room, bright and happy-looking, and, in the doing of work, seemingly forgetful of her misery. As she came in, she handed a number of sheets of typewriting to Van Helsing. He looked over them, gravely, his face brightening up as he read. Then, holding the pages between his finger and thumb, he said, "'Friend John, do you, with so much experience already, and you too, dear Madam Mina, that are young, here is a lesson. Do not fear ever to think. A half-thought has been buzzing often in my brain, but I fear to let him lose his wings. Here now, with more knowledge, I go back to where that half-thought come from, and I find that he be no half-thought at all, that be a whole thought, though so young that he is not yet strong to use his little wings. Nay, like the ugly duck of my friend Hans Anderson, he be no duck thought at all, but a big swan thought that sail nobly on big wings when the time come for him to try them. See, I read here what Jonathan have written. That other of his race, who, in a later age, again and again, brought his forces over the great river into Turkey land, who, when he was beaten back, came again, and again, and again, though he had to come alone from the bloody field, where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph. What does this tell us? Not much? No. The Count's child thought see nothing. Therefore he speaks so free. Your man thought see nothing. My man thought see nothing till just now. No, but there comes another word from someone who speak without thought, because she, too, know not what it mean, what it might mean. Just as there are elements which rest, yet when in nature's course they move on their way, and they touch the poof, and there comes a flash of light, heaven-wide, that blind and kill and destroy some. But they show up all the earth below for leagues and leagues. Is it not so? Well, I shall explain. To begin, have you ever studied the philosophy of crime? Yes and no. You, John, yes, for it is a study of insanity. You know, Madam Mina, for crime touch you not, not but once. Still, your mind works true, and argues not a particulari ad universali. There is this peculiarity in criminals, it is so constant in all countries and at all times, that even police, who know not much from philosophy, come to know it empirically, that is. That is to be empiric. The criminal always work at one crime. That is the true criminal, who seems predestinate to crime, and who will of none other. This criminal has not full man brain. He is clever and cunning and resourceful, but he be not of man's stature as to brain. He be of child brain in much. Now, this criminal of ours is predestinate to crime also. 
ye two have child brain and it is of the child to do what he have done the little bird the little fish the little animal learn not by principle but empirically and when he learn to do then there is to him the ground to start from to do more dos posto said archimedes give me a fulcrum and i shall move the world to do once is the fulcrum whereby child brain become man brain and until he have the purpose to do more he continue to do the same thing again every time just as he have done before oh my dear i see that your eyes are opened and that to you the lightning flash show all the leagues for mrs harker began to clap her hands and her eyes sparkled he went on now you shall speak tell us two dry men of science what you see with those so bright eyes he took her hand and held it whilst he spoke his finger and thumb closed on her pulse as i thought instinctively and unconsciously as she spoke the count is a criminal and of criminal type nordau and lombroso would so classify him and qua criminal he is of an imperfectly formed mind thus in a difficulty he has to seek resource and habit his past is a clue and the one page of it that we know and that from his own lips tells that once before when in what mr morris would call a tight place he went back to his country from the land he had tried to invade and thence without losing purpose prepared himself for a new effort he came again better equipped for his work and won so he came to london to invade a new land he was beaten and when all hope of success was lost and his existence in danger he fled back over the sea to his home just as formerly he had fled back over the danube from turkey land good good you oh so clever lady said van helsing enthusiastically as he stooped and kissed her hand a moment later he said to me as calmly as though he had been having a sick-room consultation seventy-two only and in all this excitement i have hope turning to her again he said with keen expectation but go on go on there is more to tell if you will be not afraid john and i know i do in any case and shall tell you if you are right speak without fear i will try to but you will forgive me if i seem too egotistical nay fear not you must be egotist for it is of you that we think then as he is criminal he is selfish and as his intellect is small and his action is based on selfishness he confines himself to one purpose that purpose is remorseless as he fled back over the danube leaving his forces to be cut to pieces so now he is intent on being safe careless of all so his own selfishness frees my soul somewhat from the terrible power which he acquired over me on that dreadful night i felt it oh i felt it thank god for his great mercy my soul is freer than it has been since that awful hour and all that haunts me is a fear lest in some trance or dream he may have used my knowledge for his ends the professor stood up he has so used your mind and by it he has left us here in varna whilst the ship that carried him rushed through an enveloping fog up to galatz where doubtless he had made preparation for escaping from us but his child mind only saw so far and it may be that as ever is in god's providence the very thing that the evil-doer most reckoned on 
for his selfish good, turns out to be his chiefest harm. The hunter is taken in his own snare, as the great psalmist says, for now that he think he is free from every trace of us all, and that he has escaped us with so many hours to him, then his selfish child brain will whisper him to sleep. He think, too, that as he cut himself off from knowing your mind, there can be no knowledge of him to you. There is where he fail. That terrible baptism of blood which he give you makes you free to go to him in spirit, as you have as yet done in your times of freedom, when the sun rise and set. At such times you go by my volition, and not by his. And this power, to good of you and others, you have won from your suffering at his hands. This is now all the more precious that he know it not, and to guard himself have even cut himself off from his knowledge of our where. We, however, are not selfish, and we believe that God is with us through all this blackness, and these many dark hours. We shall follow him, and we shall not flinch, even if we peril ourselves, that we become like him. Friend John, this has been a great hour, and it have done much to advance us on our way. You must prescribe and write him all down, so that when the others return from their work, you can give it to them. Then they shall know as we do. And so I have written it whilst we await their return, and Mrs. Harker has written with the typewriter all since she brought the manuscript to us. End of chapter 25